Sorry for the delay, everyone. Welcome to the uh, um, Huntington lowering session. So the morning session, we heard a lot about Ionis Roche's ASO approach, as well as uh, just now in the clinical trial showcase about the wave uh, allele selective ASO. Um, we're going to talk about a little, some different approaches to target Huntington. There's lots of different ways we show, people showed a lot of different slides how you can target the DNA, the RNA, or the protein to get rid of the, the, the bad protein. And today you're going to hear about two novel approaches. Uh, and the first presenter is Dr. Pavlina Konstantinova, who comes to us from Unicure. And uh, she's going to talk to you about gene therapy. Uh, using AAV viruses to deliver microRNAs to lower the expression of the Huntington protein. Thank you. Thank you, George, and yeah, uh, thank, thanks everybody, and it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I will stand like that, otherwise you don't see me, you know, if I say <laughs> something. So, if you have a look at the first slide, it's called Silencing of the Villain, and there were a lot of already presentations in the morning about that. Uh, there is one thing I want to say here. This is the PhD thesis of our first student, Jana. And uh, why I'm telling you this is because she is the one who started with me or helped me to start the Huntington Disease Project at Unicure. And it's been already five years back since we started this with her. So I think for her and, and also for Unicure, it's an achievement that we have the first student that's finishing on uh, Huntington's disease uh, gene therapy. So I will uh, show you quickly the, these slides uh, because we're a publicly listed company and uh, start with a little bit explaining what are the basics. Uh, what was mentioned before uh, earlier today, every cell in our body has 46 chromosomes. So all of us, we have 46 chromosomes and in these chromosomes we have what we can envision as the bar DNA barcode. So it, the DNA barcode in our body, it determines a lot of features. So it determines the color of the skin, or uh, you can see uh, if you're tall or short, it's also determined by your uh, DNA barcode. It also determines the color of the eyes, uh, something that uh, our uh, intelligence is uh, determined by uh, our DNA barcode. And in some cases, like also with Huntington's disease, it also determines if we are sick or healthy. So again, uh, today was mentioned the mutation of Huntington is uh, a few mistakes in our uh, DNA barcode, which are on chromosome four, on the long arm of chromosome four. And then uh, what happens is that when we have more than a certain number of CAG repeats, instead of having a healthy cell, we get a Huntington disease cell. So this is the, uh, the general idea, and, and I think we are all uh, aware of this, but this is just to help me to explain what we are trying to do in Unicure. Again, going back to chromosome four, if we have uh, in, the, in the long arm less than a certain number of CAG repeats, and it's debatable how many, but let's say between 27 and 35, we are completely healthy and the neurons that we have are healthy. In the case presented lower, if we have more than 30, uh, 35 or 40 CAG repeats, then uh, there is expression of a mutant Huntington protein, and that causes all the neurons in the brain to die off. So what do we do in Unicure and in several other companies? We try to, to get rid of the mutant Huntington protein by degrading it. So you can envision that we get a small scissor and we cut the, the mutant Huntington protein, and that causes our neurons from being uh, sick and dying off in becoming more healthy and not dying so much uh, off anymore. That's at least the concept that we have. And to do this, uh, we took a, a different, a little bit different approach. Uh, although it's already been used in neurodegenerative diseases in clinical trials, we take use of a then associated viral vector. Uh, as I say, this vector has been shown to be safe and it's been used successfully in Parkinson's disease trials and in some Filippo B trials. So we know that we can use this vector, we can deliver it to the brain and it's safe. What we did in our case, we manipulated the vector to make it specific for Huntington's disease. So we put a small molecule, which is then targeting specifically uh, the mutant Huntington uh, protein eventually. And then we made, we can produce the vector. And the idea would be, uh, since it's a viral vector, that we inject it only once in the brain of the patient. And by doing this, we can actually help that the uh, vector is expressed throughout patient's life. So 
The bad news is that we need to, to inject the vector directly in the brain, so the, the patients need to have uh, surgery. Uh, but the good news is that it needs to be done only once. So once it's in the brain, it's going to stay there, and the small molecules that are going to cut the Huntington protein are going to be expressed for life. Um, what we are doing, we are targeting the striatum, which I think, I guess most of you know. This is the region which, which is primarily affected by Huntington's disease. So we are putting the vector directly in the area, in the brain area, that's uh, the primary cause of the disease. Uh, how do we see that and what kind of patients do we envision for our first trial? This is a simple schematic of the, uh, of the disease progression of patients. And as I said, uh, what we are doing, we are, uh, we, we are envisioning to have early patients, to, so in stage one. We would inject them once uh, during their uh, late, uh, very quickly after uh, diagnosis, so when they're uh, in stage one. And then by doing this, the vector is expressing the small molecule throughout patient's life, so we envision to have a slowdown of disease progression. Uh, as I said, uh, we, will, we would put it directly in the stratum. However, what we know from this vector is that it would spread not only, uh, it will stay not only in the injected area, but it would also spread to other brain areas, and one of them, of course, is the cortical region, which is very important because the cortex in Huntington's disease is also affected in later stages of, uh, of the disease. What we know from our studies is that when we inject it in the, uh, in the primary area, it will spread and then it will follow the natural cause of the disease. Uh, that is different from the approaches that are used with intrathecal injection, where so far, at least, we have not been able to uh, reach the deeper brain structures when we are uh, injecting vectors um, intrathecally. Of course, everybody is working in this direction, but we would be looking in the coming years uh, for successes in using a different approach of uh, delivering uh, vectors or antisense oligos. So to make sure that we can deliver the vector and, and prepare for, uh, for uh, the first clinical trial, we took use of animals that are having a bit of larger brain. So in this case, it's uh, monkeys, macaques or Huntington disease pigs. Uh, both study, both uh, uh, have already been discussed. Why we are using it is because they have a larger brain. So the, the size of the brain is about seven times smaller than the human brain, but it comes mainly on the account of the cortical region. So uh, what we have done, we have done a number of preclinical experiments where we have injected uh, our vector in the striatum uh, of, the, of, of monkeys and, uh, and uh, um, pigs, and we have looked how the vector spreads. So you can see here, uh, first of all, a reconstruction of one of these injections. So we are targeting, in this case, only putamen, and this is a reconstruction of the area that has been covered. So you see it's a very small area, about 5% of the brain that has been injected. On the left side, you see uh, staining, uh, so when it's brown in the vector, uh, in the brain, you see, uh, you, uh, this is representing where the vector has gone. So the darker the brown color, the more vector copies you find there. So what you see is that actually the injected area, which is the stratum, this one, has the strongest uh, signal, but also the vector nicely spreads to the cortical areas. Similarly, we have done this for uh, Huntington disease peaks. And uh, we have done exactly the same procedure, and we have achieved uh, very, very similar data. Uh, a good advantage of the Huntington disease peak is that it also contains the human Huntington gene, so the mutant Huntington gene. Uh, so that makes it a very unique model to study safety, but also kinetic and pharmacodynamic of any therapy for Huntington lowering. So what we did, again, uh, injected in the stratum, uh, the pigs are, as I said, they're called mini pigs, but they're about 100 kilograms. They have a large brain, so a perfect model to look for lowering of Huntington in the brain, but also possibly for biomarkers. So uh, what happens in the cerebrospinal fluids after we lower Huntington uh, in the brain? So uh, this is an example of uh, our experiment, which we started about a year ago. And this is at six months after we have injected the pigs. So what we have done, we injected the pigs, and six months later we sacrificed them, and we sliced the brain throughout, so starting from the front to the back, and then we look at how much Huntington we can measure 
Huntington protein links to a, a normal non-injected animal. So what you see, this is from the front to the back, and these are all the number of samples that were taken. So it's a huge number of uh, samples that we took. So what you can see with red, that's where we inject the vector. Um, you see that we get about 60-70% uh, knockdown, uh, a lowering of Huntington, which is very good news, that's what you expect. But also very good is that we see very spread of the vector, as we have already shown earlier, to the front and a little bit to the back of the brain. So that gave us confidence that we can move forward, at least from an efficacy standpoint, to test this vector further for, for, uh, uh, in clinical trials. Another major question which we always uh, have is when we lower Huntington in the brain, can we measure lowering in the CSF? So again, this is an experiment done in the pigs. They were five years of age. And uh, this is the six month data point. I have to say, Fran, this experiment is ongoing. So we are collecting data on that. So what you can see here is before dozing, we set it at um, 100% so this is our reference point and then we were able to take two samples at three and six months after we injected the animals from the cerebral spinal fluid and look how if we can measure lowering of the Huntington in the cerebral spinal fluid. So we were very pleasantly surprised similar to other studies that we can measure lowering of human Huntington in these animals which gives us confidence that we can use possibly this for uh, further development of a biomarker in the clinical studies. So where we are now and what are our next steps? So in terms of development of the project, we have uh, re received orphan drug designation last year, which means that it allows us to continue with this program further, both from FDA and from the European regulatory agencies. We have already completed um, safety studies in monkeys and rats. And we are in the process of finalizing the IND, which is a big dossier, which we submit to, uh, the, to the FDA, to the regulatory agencies. And we envision to do that at the end of, before the end of this year, with the idea to start a clinical trial uh, early next year. So this is about the development of the project. And there is one more topic I want to touch about. And this is what are we actually doing as a next step in order to help patients to really look uh, more personalized into if there would be differences in the therapeutic response between them. So about a few, two years ago, we started a new uh, line uh, in which we develop uh, what we call mini brains in a dish. Uh, why do we do that? Uh, first of all, because in the field that's outside of the research field, animal experiments are perceived quite negatively. But secondly, also because we envision that there might be some small differences in patient-to-patient -patient response to our therapy. So we want to be sure that the therapy would have, a, uh, uh, would have a the proper response uh, depending on the differences between the different Huntington patients. So what we did, we, we took Huntington uh, donor uh, cells and we were able to differentiate those cells to, in a small dish to what we call mini-brains or organoids. And in this case, these are cerebral organoids, so you can see them there. They're really small, but if you would stain the little brain, you see that it uh, keeps the structure, a similar structure, and also you can stain for specific cell types that are uh, specific for the brain. And the next thing we did, uh, we tried to see if our vector that we have can uh, infect those cells. So to, to see if there would be differences in the tropism of the AAV, uh, depending on the cell type that we are uh, infecting. So in this case, this is not the Huntington therapeutic. This is a vector that contains a fluorescent dye that helps you to uh, visualize the vector in the cell. And you can see that there, uh, there are four uh, uh, neuronal cell types or brain cell types. Uh, uh, frontal brain neurons, uh, dopaminergic neurons, astrocytes, and even motor neurons. And with our vector, we were successful uh, to very uh, good transduce those cells, which already gives, an, uh, gives us uh, an indication that if we 
want to use these mini brands to have a personalized therapy, the vector would have a good tropism to, to these uh, different cells. So this is a work in progress and I hope in the coming years there will be more news, not only from us but for also from other companies on that. But I think it would be really important to be able to look individually at each patient how the therapy is working before we get into clinical trials. So a short summary of what I told you. We have uh, designed uh, AMT-130, we call it, therapy for Huntington's disease. We have a very extensive preclinical package looking into rodent models, in, into transgenic uh, peak and also in non-human primates, uh, also for the GLP-TOC study. We are able to show that we can lower Huntington in the CSF of uh, transgenic peaks, so that's good news for developing biomarkers. And uh, as I said, IND, we are preparing our IND with the idea to start a clinical trial uh, next year. A very important slide is the acknowledgement slide. It's been a huge effort, although a small data set that, uh, here. Uh, and a lot of uh, collaborators have been involved, so I would like to acknowledge them. Uh, I have a few names in orange. First of all, Melvin uh, Effers, who is the scientist on this project and has been really driving the project in the last two and a half years. Uh, and then Harold Petri and Sandra van Deventer, who are really, who are really important for not only starting the project in Unicure, but also keeping it alive. So that, that the place where we are today, it's really thanks to them. So thank you all for your attention, and I would like to take some questions. We have time for some questions. Are there any questions? Now this just knocks down the mutant Huntington protein or does it knock down both Huntington proteins? Uh, we, in our approach we are knocking down both uh, mutant and wild type Huntington. Now I would think that some of the research that's being done by some of the other people, you've got to prove then that doing that does some good. And that's one of the other things that people are looking at. One of the issues here though is, is that they've talked about is that you can't really turn it off once you put it in. So you know, it's not like, oh geez, you know, we don't, uh, we're not going to go and get any more stuff. You're, you, once it's in there, you've got it, and that's it. Yeah, that's a relevant point, and that's why we, are we have done such an extensive preclinical studies to show that when we can turn it out, first of all, we know how much we are going to turn it down, depending on how much vector we are using. That's the first point. And the second point is that uh, in none of these studies that we have done, we have seen uh, safety or toxicity issues. But we are very well aware of that, and actually, one of the reasons why we have put this uh, Huntington disease mini peak study, a long-term study, which is at the moment one year after injection, is to look indeed for this question. So we will have six months, one year, two years. We will be looking continuously uh, for these uh, questions. And, but at the moment where we are, we don't think that there are any safety concerns due to lowering also of the wild type Huntington. Any other questions? John. Following up on that same point, uh, is there any rescue strategy if, if somehow down the line you find out that occasionally uh, you've lowered Huntington too much, is there any way to, at all to, to rescue the patient? So um, the only thing that we, we will do, uh, is because as I said, once the vector is injected into the brain, we cannot take it out anymore, that's true. So we will start with a really low dose of a vector, and then we would allow a relatively long time be between the first patients being injected and the next one. So uh, the, that's the only prevention we can do in order to make sure that the therapy that we are using is safe. But once the vector is there, it would not be able to stop the expression of the, of the small molecules anymore. So. Anyone else? Yep. So did you observe any immune response uh, to the AAV dose to the brain, uh, either in the brain or in the systemic circulation? So when you inject uh, AAV in the brain or anywhere in the body, you normally would expect to have some immune activation. We have not seen any severe immune response due to the injection of the AV. Of course, we see the traces that we have injected AV in the brain, as you would see it in any other parts of the body, but we have not seen any 
severe uh, immune response uh, events due to the AAV in the brain. And as I said, this is not something that has not been done yet. Uh, in Parkinson's, uh, there have been several studies where AAV has been used and, and uh, it's been shown to be safe. So I think immune response is something that we will monitor, but I don't, we don't expect that this is going to be a severe uh, issue for our trial. Hi, this is Blanca from UCLA. I'm wondering, is this virus infecting all the neurons or other cells in the brain? So, um, or at least if it's expressed in other cells? The virus is infecting, uh, it's AV5, so it's a serotype 5. So it has a preference for the neuron, neuronal cells, but we know that it's also infecting other cell types, as I showed you. So we are also able to infect astrocytes and dopaminergic neurons. So it will be also having a tropism to other cell types. Great, thank you, Pavlina. <laughs> so our final speaker is uh, Dr. Liz Elizabeth Doherty from CHDI. She's been at CHDI since 2015, is currently the Director of Medicinal Chemistry at CHI, and she's going to talk to you a, a, about a novel approach to develop a small molecule to lower Huntington's levels. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm, hi. hi. I'm Liz Doherty. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. I am going to stand behind the podium. Uh, so I'm in the program as Dr. Doherty. I'm not actually a doctor. I want you to know that up front. I'm a chemist. I have a PhD in chemistry. Um, I gave this talk uh, last year, or a talk like this, I should say, last year at a uh, scientific conference uh, conducted by CHDI. And George saw the talk there and he said, Liz, could you come to the HDSA and tell the HDSA community about the same topic? So I reworked it. This is, I can see there's scientists in the room. I know who you are. Um, <laughs> but this, this talk is not for you, it's for people who want to understand drug discovery a little better. So I'm going to use plain language, so bear with me. Um, first off, and I know Robert talked about this a little bit earlier, but for those people who might have missed it, let me tell you a little bit about the CHDI Foundation. We're a nonprofit. We're not doing this to make money. We're doing this to get drugs to you. That's all we're focused on. We're funded by very generous donors, and it's a blessing. We don't compete. Uh, we don't encourage people to compete, or companies to compete, or academics to compete. We collaborate. Uh, we're involved directly in drug discovery. We don't just hand out funds and then sit back and, you know, hope that things are going to go well, or, you know, the, the, which is a good thing too, though. Handing out funds is a great thing. Uh, but we actually work ourselves at the bench with uh, a vast organization of researchers who are in uh, contract research organizations or academic labs, um, and we have this global network where we share information, we share tools, and we share best practices, which is really, I think, the most important thing that we bring to, the, to this work. So a lot of the CHDI staff is around you. Let me tell you, we're very dedicated. We think about this disease all day. Uh, we work on it all the time. I get emails from people on the weekend saying, hey, Liz, look at this, what do you think? Uh, and back and forth, we're always talking, we dream about it. So we've got a passion for this science in, in serving you. Okay, so a little science. Um, not a lot of data, but a bit of background on what, we, what the biology is and what drug discovery science looks like from our perspective. So you've talked about DNA, RNA, protein. You've seen this many times already today. Um, I like to think about it as a bucket. And this is an easier way for me to visualize the level of Huntington protein. So at the top of the bucket, you have the production. The Huntington is being produced in all the cells of your body, all the time. Um, and it maintains a level, the protein level, in your, in your cells because at the same time that it's being produced, it's also being cleared. Your normal, everybody's normal healthy cells are producing Huntington. They're clearing Huntington, they're getting rid of Huntington, and they're keeping a steady level of protein to function as whatever, fun how, however Huntington needs to function. 
Now, if you want to lower the protein, you've got gene therapies like knocking down the DNA transcriptional events. Um, and that essentially turns off the spigot, clearance continues, the protein level lowers. So hopefully you see the water level went down in the bucket. Um, the other way you can do this is interfering with RNA translation. You know, so we're, we've talked about gene therapies. You've seen the, the beautiful Ionis results. You've, you've heard about things like Unicure. This acts on the DNA levels and the RNA levels. Um, the other way you can lower protein is it's continually produced, but you add a couple holes to the bucket, if you can see them down there. Yeah, there's my arrow. Uh, and you increase the rate of clearance, you're going to lower the level of protein, right? So you've got a lot of ways to lower protein. Which way is the best way? We don't know. Um, but we'd like to find out. And so we're doing a lot of biology to, to understand that better. Um, there's another thing to consider, and that has been talked about in a variety of ways, and you've seen these great images of brains and spinal fluid, you know, spinal taps and things like that. Um, and that's to understand the problem of the blood-brain barrier. Everybody's brain has, is just full of blood vessels that feed every cell in the brain, keeps your brain healthy. Every neuron in your brain has a blood vessel a very short distance from it. Uh, all of these neurons are being fed uh, constantly. Um, the the blood-brain barrier is helping to remove uh, detritus from your brain. It's, it's feeding your brain. Um, but your brain is really good at protecting itself. There's a barrier between each of these blood vessels and the cells in your brain, and we call that barrier the blood-brain barrier, the BBB. And what this does is it keeps your brain from being attacked by any foreign elements. Uh, the brain is different than any other organ in your body in this respect. Large molecules that we've talked about a lot um, and Pavlina had this great talk. She showed you the, the, this uh, viral vector delivery of large molecules. Large molecules don't really cross this blood-brain barrier from, from the blood into the brain, so you can't take them as a pill. They're just not going to get into your brain. Um, you can't even really inject them into your, into your uh, 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 blood and expect them to get into the brain. You have to come up with these sort of, you know, background ways of getting them in. And the viral vectors is a really great way to do that. Uh, small molecule drugs may, however, cross right across the blood-brain barrier. So a small molecule drug is something that you can take a in a pill form. It's going to distribute all around your body. It's also going to get into your brain if we do our jobs right as chemists and make it do that. So the challenge to discovering drugs for Huntington lowering is not just the biology. It's the blood-brain barrier. So, talked about large molecules and small molecules. You might not know what, that, what I mean by that. Um, I'm showing a kind of a schematic of what a large molecule drug might look like in size to a chemist relative to a small molecule drug. A large molecule drug, like I said, can enter the brain by direct injection or injection into the spinal fluid. Um, it's large by virtue of the fact, like, all right, picture large and small, maybe a small molecule drug is a grape, a large molecule is like a watermelon. You know, you can swallow a grape, you can't swallow a watermelon, right? So that's a good way to visualize it. Um, but the wonderful thing about a large molecule drug is because it's large, because of the mechanism of action, how these work, they can be very target selective, and that's very important to you. The target is Huntington protein. No other protein in your body, right? No other process in your body, just the Huntington protein. And large molecules do that beautifully. The advantage to a small molecule drug is you could take a pill. You know, everybody takes pills. We know what that's like. Um, they can enter the brain more readily. I touched on that. They distribute widely in the body. The dose can be titrated. So someone touched on this a moment ago. Um, there is a concern if you direct something, uh, directly inject something into the brain and it stays there and it's lowering your protein, that at some point, shouldn't it stop? You know, should it, should it get out of your brain again? That's something that people are paying close attention to for good reasons, for your health, for your safety, and have a lot of reasons to believe that it's manageable. Uh, the nice thing about a small molecule drug, as you probably know, 
You stop taking it, it goes away. So the effect that it's exerting goes away when you stop taking it. Another thing to consider that we don't talk about a lot uh, is the accessibility to patients. Large molecule drugs are beautiful and we're full of hope and excitement about them and they're paving the way. But there's a lot of people with HD and large molecule, molecule drugs cost a lot and we hope that cost can be managed in the future and that um, insurance companies will be more generous about reimbursing for the cost of these treatments and we've got to work toward that. Uh, but small molecule drugs can be more affordable to patients, more globally accessible. But there's a downside. Target selectivity can be a challenge. Now you don't have the virtue of this large molecule that can be very specific for hunting to protein. You have to be much more clever with the type of drug that you make. So that's the background. Everybody still with me? How do we find them? One thing that chemists do in the pharmaceutical industry all around the world is something called high throughput screening. The idea of high throughput screening is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Imagine this haystack is all the possible drugs in the world piled into one pile and you've got to find that one drug and it is literally a tiny little uh, odds of happening in this huge pile of drugs that you're going to find that one drug that's going to work exactly the way you want it to do. This process requires very sophisticated equipment. Uh, researchers who are skilled in the art of searching for drugs by high throughput screening, time, and a lot of persistence, uh, and a lot of money. So the other thing it requires is a cell assay. Um, a cell assay, basically what I'm showing you in this image here is a dish with 96 little wells in it. And each of those wells has a little pool of cells from an animal. They're living cells, they're growing cells, they're making Huntington protein, they're destroying Huntington protein, they're living, they're breathing happily in these cells, in these wells, I'm sorry. Uh, so you need a cell assay. You also need compound screening collection. The small molecule drug is what we call a compound, right? Collections are basically, uh, in each and every one of these vials is a different small molecule drug, a different potential small molecule drug. Some of these don't even know they're drugs yet. They've never been used as drugs. And you can have large collections, that becomes your haystack. You also need robotics and automation. This gets really sophisticated too. Um, this is an image of one of these plates with all the cells in it, with the, with the wells filled with living cells, and you have these little needle tips, and a robot moves them over, they add things, it subtracts things, all sorts of things happen. There's computer algorithms that, that add things up and give us an image of what's going on. It gets really complicated. Now, the other thing we need are cells, and the question is, what cells do we want to use? It's a very important question. Why don't we just use animal cells? If they can live in this well, no problem, you know, or yeast or uh, bacteria. Why not just use that? Um, only human beings suffer from Huntington's disease. And Huntington's disease biology is a human biology. So we believe that the best place to screen is in human cells. And those human cells um, that the CHDI screening strategy is using are not only coming from human donors, uh, we're also selecting them to represent the CAG length that represents the largest amount of the population, patient population in the hopes that we find something that works in this cell type. It's going to work for all patients. Um, and also we're very careful to confirm that what we see, this lowering effect that we're seeing in this individual cell in a, in a, on a plate, uh, also works in cells from other donors, not just one donor but any, several donors and also across different human cell types. So maybe adipocytes, lymphocytes, things from the blood, things from the muscle, and certainly things from the brain. Uh, that's where we have uh, our most profound contribution from the HD community, I think, right there. This is where people literally are putting their skin in the game to support drug research to benefit the future. I want to point out too though, it's not just HD patients, it's the brothers and sisters. Because we, we need those folks, they have very similar biology, right? So you have an HD patient cell type, the brother, sister, maybe they've got normal CAG length, 
both copies, we've got to compare. So that's also useful, getting the family involved. Now, what does the biological screening assay need to do? First off, it needs to show that the drug lowers mutant protein. Um, we also have to answer the question, does it lower uh, the normal protein or the wild type protein? Uh, and then we certainly have to determine whether it's toxic to the cell. So if it's lowering the protein just because the cell is dying, that's non-starter. It's called a false positive. We can't go further. Um, this is probably the most scientific -y image that I've got in the slide deck. I apologize. But you know, Doug showed it earlier today, I think much better than I'm showing here now. We're using the same assay that Doug developed uh, with CHDI to measure mutant Huntington protein in your CSF. Why not use that same assay to measure in cells and do the screening? So again, it's antibodies. He showed the antibody binds here, binds there. They pair up, they fluoresce. And what that looks like on the plate is a green glow, right? So where you see protein, the well is glowing green. When that color fades away, the protein is lowering, okay? This is the plate with all the cells on it. The compounds are on those cells. You're measuring protein levels by that green glow. Next thing, screening collections. And there was a woman out in the hall who asked a really good question. I hope this answers it. Uh, where do we get these collections, this haystack of drugs to screen through? One place we do and CHDI has done is we go to commercial sources. You can buy these things uh, in vials and you can put them in plates and you can put them in a bank and use them over and over again. We've invested a great deal of money in building our own collection, over 100,000 compounds, um, to screen. There's another wonderful place you can get potential drugs and that's from nature. So God is the original medicinal chemist. Uh, he put all these drugs out there for us to find. They're harder to find when they come from nature, I'll tell you that up front, because it's a lot of, a lot of things mixed up out there in herbal, herbal medications or from fungi or whatnot. I've put in an image of the ocean here because you can get drugs from, from marine sponges, you can get drugs from anywhere. And we can't ignore that source. But the big kahuna, the mother load, is in big pharma. So big pharma companies have been building compound collections for screening for decades. And they've gotten good at it. And they've got good collections full of really wonderful, bioactive, potentially effective drugs sitting in banks, tall shelves full of them. And we'd love to access them. And in fact, big pharma is a really nice place to talk. Uh, we've talked to companies like AstraZeneca and Lilly uh, and other companies that have things called the Open Innovation Programs. And here's where they're supplying folks like us with their compounds at no cost to help us fuel drug discovery. And I think that's a marvelous thing. So what does the screening and validation process look like? Um, it kind of looks like a funnel. That's how I like to picture it. The top of the funnel, you've got all these compound collections. You can have hundreds of thousands, you can have over a million compounds to screen. And so at the top of the funnel enters the compounds. You screen for those compounds that show lowering of protein. Those are your hits. Then you weed through those and you throw out those hits that are just hitting because they're toxic. You get rid of your false positives and now you're down to hundreds of compounds to consider. Then the medicinal chemist steps in with the help of the, of the biologist, you synthesize and you test compounds that are related to those hits, and you confirm that that activity is real, that it's reproducible, and that as a chemist, you can, you can tailor that molecule to make it better, to make it more potent, more selective. But it doesn't end there. Then at that point, you might have a handful of what we call validated hits. To progress them to drugs, we need to understand how they're working. We're not going to get very far and do this safely if we don't know how they work. So that requires understanding the mechanism of action. Pavlina showed you a talk that describes something where there is a clearly understood mechanism of action. That's where you need to be with a small molecule drug too. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to achieve the selectivity and the safety. Now, once you've gotten these validated hits from your screen, it goes into what we like to call the small molecule drug discovery pipeline. Um, and this is something that's been going on for decades in the, in the drug industry. 
you go from screening to a, a process called hit to lead and lead optimization. That's where the medicinal chemist is tinkering with the small molecule, making it better and better, making sure it's safe so that you can move into preclinical studies, make sure it's safe in animals, so that you can get to the clinical trials to make sure that it's efficacious. The timeline, however, from screen hit to clinical trials can be pretty long. You saw the, the long timeline for the IONIS. That was, that was about on par with what it takes, you know, to get, especially with something that's brand new, that, that's, you're coming up with a mechanism of action that's new, no one's heard of it before, you gotta make it sure it's safe, the FDA is gonna okay that and move it forward. But it could take like 10 to 15 years. What's encouraging is that right now, the screening in CHDI's labs is yielding hits. And we're very excited about that, and we're gonna push them as hard as we can. One way to push them faster is if it's a really great bona fide hit, we can squeeze this hit to lead, lead optimization time down by being smart, by adding more resources, um, by being very clever. But another way we can jump start to the finish line is to get a compound out there that's already been identified that we believe in and invest in that. And that's a process we call outreach. So we're always reaching out to the community and the community of the research community is reaching back to us and saying, hey, we've got a compound that, that's got the chops. We, we think it's gonna do what you need it to do. Tell us what you think of it. We evaluate those compounds in all our assays. We decide if we think it's a really good idea based on a lot of information, a lot of people's input. And every once in a while, we come up with a really nice idea. I mean, we don't, we, we identify one, we're lucky enough to. And one of the most exciting new things that we've uh, uh, identified as an outreach opportunity, or I should say collaboration opportunity, is uh, the small molecules coming from PTC Therapeutics. Uh, so we just announced in April this collaboration with PTC. The PTC uh, company, the organization, has discovered small molecules that act like an ASO acts at the RNA level. These act at the RNA level to lower the total Huntington protein, not mutant-specific, total. Um, they don't act by the same mechanism of action as the ASO. They've got their own. But we think this mechanism of action is very robust and that we can work with this. We can push this along. They've shown that um, the small molecule lowers in human donor HD cell lines across multiple cell types. That was the goal I mentioned before. Uh, and also showed that some efficacy in lowering in a mouse HD model, and um, we're, it's very encouraging. It's pretty far along the path. And very importantly, the molecules do get into the brain. So I want to leave you with this really positive thought. Everything that is going on in gene therapy, in the ASOs, IONIS, all, all of these activities we believe in, we're supporting, and they're, and they're great, and, they're the first, and the excitement is really high. But we are leaving no stone unturned when it comes to the future for HD patients. Getting small molecules by screening, by outreach, and even new strategies that are coming out of our collaborations that I, it would take me another five hours to talk about. So everything is being looked at on your behalf. Um, so I want to thank, before I go, uh, some of the companies we work with, Charles River, IRBM, AMRI, Evotech, and especially PTC. Uh, but I especially want to thank all of you in the community for being involved. I think this, none of this could happen as effectively as it does without the real commitment from the HD patient community and those donor cells. I can't even begin to tell you how important those are. So um, thank you very much, and I welcome any questions. Any questions for Liz? Hey, Tom? Yeah, I was here maybe 15 years ago at these HDA, HSA conventions. I remember when CHDI got started, and they it sounds like the exact same thing they did 15 years ago, okay? They said, you know, there's all these medications out there and things like that. They just haven't tested them all. We're going to do this large-scale thing. We're going to check all these things. We're going to do large-scale thing, and we're going to find all this stuff. And they did that, and they didn't find anything. 
So what's different now? That's a great question, yeah. especially because I'm prepared to answer it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, what happened years ago was CHDI Foundation said, wow, everybody's publishing all these uh, publications. This drug works, that drug's w drug works, this is my evidence. And there were lots of drugs out there that people were claiming worked, right? Well, they were gonna, they were gonna look at not only stuff that, that worked, then they were gonna check everything from every place that was already out there. I mean, they were just gonna try everything that's out there and see if any of it had, anything had an effect on HD. And I, I, I would say it was thousands of drugs they were gonna look at. I don't know if it was thousands, but it was a lot. I mean, I wasn't there back then, but it all fell out. And that was a very important exercise and a very expensive exercise to conduct using more rigorous models and more rigorous tools to study these effects, they all dropped out. And that's a very important point to make right now because that's what forced us to go back to the drawing board and look not from what people were claiming had an effect in this model, that model, here, there, and everywhere, but to use rigor all of this stuff that we've learned in the 15 years since to come up with much more precise analysis much more rigorous studies to identify something that really works, that's really worth pursuing. Oh, he's so much better suited to answer this. Yes. So I, I think the, the presentation you're referring to was a collaboration that we had with a company called Combinatorics. So what Combinatorics did is they had a library of 3,000 compounds that were um, either approved drugs or what's called grass, generally regarded as safe. And the attractive part of that was that um, there's no quicker way of getting to the clinic than with those molecules because they've already shown that they're safe and, and well tolerated. So the idea was very clever. In fact, not only um, did Combinatorics propose testing those 3,000 molecules, they proposed testing those 3,000 molecules at 10 different concentrations in a matrix of a combination, pairwise combination of, of all of them. Okay, so um, there were, I think, two issues. Uh, it, you're absolutely right, nothing came, came out of that. So there were, there were two issues. The first one is, it turns out that um, the cure for Huntington's is probably not sitting on a shelf. Okay, and a big part of what, um, even in combination with something else, and a big part of what medicinal chemists like Liz and her partners do um, is to create novel chemical matter, compounds that don't exist yet. Um, it turns out there are something like 10 to the 80th different combinations, so there's a lot more molecules that need to be made than the ones that just happen to be. Uh, it takes longer, and so you know we wanted to try the ones that existed already, but uh, we're now having to, having to go back to sort of from scratch to make new molecules. The other big difference is that combinatorics is screened because it had to do so many different combinations. If you do the math of you know, 3,000 times 10 squared, it's a big number. And so the assay that was used back then was just to look and see whether or not sick cells that were made sick by Huntington's got, by expressing the mutant Huntington gene, actually even just a fragment thereof, got better. And that's a pretty big black box, right? You really don't know the mechanism. And as Liz pointed out very effectively, uh, if you're really gonna make a drug, you have to know very precisely how it's working. And so a big difference in this approach now is that we know that we're looking, it's a, first of all, it starts off with a much smaller black box. We're not looking at the overall viability of the cell. Uh, we're looking at whether or not it can modulate levels of just that one protein, Huntington. And then we have a series of other assays that break it down molecularly so we can see how it's carrying out that job. Is it doing it by uh, inhibiting a kinase or stimulating a phosphatase or you know, something else? So I think that's going to be a big difference in this it's approach. much more sophisticated than what you were doing. Much more sophisticated. And you know, the, the thing that, again, like came across loud and clear in, um, in Liz's uh, presentation is that um, we've already got now bona fide hits and things that are progressing forward. So you, know, you can put your fishing rod in the water and hope for the best, but if you don't catch anything, you know, you've got nothing to start with. So we've got the starting materials now, um, and whenever you do that, the probability of technical success, the uncertainty go, you know, goes way down, and the timelines become much more well-defined. What did I answer? Because there, there was, a, there was a, a study we did where we, in, in animals, yeah, that's, that's a different thing. Yeah, that's a different 
but that was also something we did to, yeah. I have a um, little bit more of a, a comment and a um, suggestion. Um, as a social worker um, who has the honor and privilege of serving the patients um, that are part of that community, I appreciate that you bring up access, patient access to these drugs. Um, and also that when those discussions are being had, that you include the social worker and, and invite us to the table because we are very strong advocates, we're highly trained professionals mm -hmm. that can provide some insight in that regard. Yeah, thank you for that, yeah. I'll leave it. Uh, great talk. Uh, how to make sure that from the drugs that you have selected, they're still crossing the blood-brain barrier? I know you said small molecules do it, but how do you make sure on the next stage that they do cross the, yeah. cr the blood-brain barrier? That's a great question I'd love to answer too. Um, so it, it's, this is very much baked into the drug discovery process. Uh, all, all companies that do big drug discovery, we have uh, cell-based in vitro assays that we can do that show that a cell get, that a, a small molecule gets into the cell, um, how it's metabolized, uh, how it, it gets cleared and managed in the body. But we've got this really amazing thing that we developed at IRBM now with these brilliant coworkers. It's a, um, a blood-brain barrier model in a dish. So it actually is uh, um, the, uh, Mark help me, I'm blanking. It, yes, endothelial cells. It forms this barrier. It's like it's just like the blood-brain barrier, except in a dish. You can apply a compound to one side of it and measure how much gets to the other side. And even cooler than that, you can see whether that model actually actively pumps the drug in or out, or is transported in or pumped out. It's very sophisticated. And we can introduce this early in the process to, to be smarter and quicker about selecting drugs. All right, well, we're out of time. Um, thank you so much. One more round of applause for Liz and Pavlina.